You're listening to the Stoic Solutions Podcast, practical wisdom for everyday life. I'm Justin Vakula, and this is episode 52, Gregory Sadler on Human Nature. Visit my website at stoicsolutionspodcast.com, where you can connect with me on social media and listen to past episodes. Support my work by becoming a donor through Patreon or PayPal to access special rewards, including the ability to have upcoming guests answer your questions, custom podcast episodes, group conversations with me and podcast listeners, and one-on-one discussion. Join my new Discord chat server, linked in the show notes, for interactive discussion with me and people interested in Stoicism. Share, comment, like, subscribe, and leave reviews to help support my efforts and keep this project going. Email me with your thoughts, justinvacula at gmail.com. Today's guest, Gregory Sadler, taught philosophy, religious studies, and critical thinking courses at universities and prisons for 20 years. He's a public speaker, hosts a popular YouTube channel, offers philosophical counseling and consulting work, and serves as president and founder of Reason IO, offering services to put philosophy into practice, working with corporate executives and leaders, psychologists, students, and professors in one-on-one sessions and workshops. He has a PhD from Southern Illinois University Carbondale. Consider, too, supporting his efforts on Patreon.com. We talk about what it means to be a human, how we can harness the better parts of ourselves, work to make progress, the social nature of humans, the importance of friendship amidst our discussion of the Stoic maxim, living in accordance with nature. Enjoy the conversation. All right. Thank you for joining me for a discussion today. Oh, you're very welcome. Glad to come back on. We spoke about anger in a previous episode, and now we're back again to talk about following nature, a term that's often misunderstood, questioned, and here we are to talk about it today. Yeah, and there's, I mean, there's even controversy in the modern Stoic community about whether modern Stoics should care about this whole following nature business or whether it's best just put, you know, behind us, uh, like some of the other elements of Stoic doctrine. Mm -hmm. Now, what is the history of this? You said this has been in many circles outside of Stoicism. You know, the whole, the whole idea of, of nature itself and being in accordance with it or following it or taking our cues from it. You see that outside of Stoic virtue ethics and in other virtue ethics as well, and not just in the West, sort of cross-culturally, but even the Stoic concept of living or being or acting in accordance with nature has a long developmental history. And, and you can see this if you look in Diogenes Laertes or in Arius Didymus's epitome of, of Stoic ethics, because they tell us that, well, Zeno came up with one idea, and then Cleanthes comes along and, and adds to it, and Chrysippus adds to it yet more. And sometimes they get into some, some arguments with each other. And uh, Arius tells us, actually, that like each of the Stoic skull arcs added something to it all the way down to uh, Panatius. So, you know, there's, there's, there's quite a lot going on there. And then when we have Epictetus, he adds even a further wrinkle by no longer just talking about, say, acting in accordance with nature or living in accordance with nature. He talks about having our, our faculty of choice, our, our proiresis in accordance with nature. And that's really where he puts uh, the, the central emphasis. So it's, it's you know, it's a kind of ambiguous concept, right? It's it, it means a lot of different things. And then when we go through the Stoic texts, particularly the people that we still have a lot of, uh, you know, Seneca and Epictetus and Marcus Aurelius and, and even uh, Masonius Rufus, we see all these examples of things that they think are in accordance with nature and things that are out of accordance with nature. So that makes it more complicated as well, you know, when we try to reconstruct a picture of it. Mm -hmm. And we even see in Eastern philosophy, perhaps in Taoism and other traditions about this harmony with nature being one, this kind of oneness 
acceptance, right? That's that's sort of a good lead in. You know, one of the uh, differences in this development was Cleanthes talked about living in accordance with nature being in accordance with the whole, the totality. And, you know, sto- so Stoicism would say maybe like accepting our fate, you know, not expecting the universe to act in ways that it, that it, it, it won't because it's just not set up that way. Mm. But then there's also, Chrysippus pointed out, there's distinctively human nature. And so, you know, there's, I think that's there in Taoism. And, and you also see a major emphasis in that uh, in Confucianism, that we have a, a nature that has to be cultivated, we can go wrong in a lot of different ways. And so there, there's a lot of room for comparison, I think, between, you know, not just, say, Stoic ethics and Aristotelian ethics or Platonist ethics, but, you know, Stoic ethics and, and Confucianist ethics or, or other Eastern approaches. Right. And you mentioned human nature. We see some of the good points, the bad points, and what is that harmony? What should we strive for is a question that comes up a lot in the Stoic texts. Definitely. And, and it's, it's something developmental. I think one of the places where people get confused about this, and this may be one reason why some of the modern Stoics think we should abandon the notion, is when you say living in accordance with human nature, some people will look at theories of human nature and will be like, well, you know, Hobbes says that we're all a bunch of, you know, <laughs> terrible people who are out to get each other. And and that's just, yeah, exactly. That's just human nature. So I'm supposed to act like that. That sounds terrible. And, and so, you know, what, what's lurking in the background is we're talking about a fully developed human nature, which which we may not even have complete representatives of, you know, when we think about the sage, this legendary figure, uh, we don't we don't come across them very often. Even the people that we, you know, if we're thinking in terms of, of Stoic ethics that we look to, like say Socrates or Zeno or Epictetus himself, they all had different roles. And so, you know, fully developed human nature in Socrates might not look exactly the same as what it's supposed to be in you or in me. So, you know, these these models themselves have to be a bit more complex than just one cookie cutter, you might say, you know? Mm-hmm. Yes, what roles are we going to play as the Stokes will talk about? Well, if you're a politician, this is what's to be expected in this sphere. This is how you should treat people as we'll still have the virtues. It's a question of how do we apply those to certain situations? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then, you know, we, I mean, we do have one common human nature that we do share. And, but, you know, how do we develop it? That's, that's the key question that Stoicism, I think, is providing us with an answer to. Right. It's looking for a foundation, how to structure our lives, what should be the thought processes we have, those we reject, questioning our desires, right? Yeah. I mean, a a good example of something that the classic Stoics talked about in terms of living in accordance with nature or being out of accordance with nature is the ways our emotions move us. And, you know, the Stoics thought that there there were some good emotions, the eupathe, and then, you know, there were a lot of other ones uh, that, that got us into trouble. You know, we talked when we were uh, discussing anger about the fact that the Stoics have kind of a zero tolerance policy when it comes to anger, right? As opposed to the Aristotelians or, or the Platonists or, or the, the Epicureans, pretty much in opposition to everybody else, because everybody else thought there was some point to it. But the Stoics thought, no, it's, it's um, even though it is something that is in some sense natural to us, it's a damaged or a not fully developed human nature that culminates in, in getting angry and chewing people out and punching mm. them or doing passive aggressive things to them. A fully developed human nature would involve other emotional reactions, maybe compassion towards the person or just simply, you know, maintaining one's uh, equanimity and not, not being affected by them. Right. It's a good distinction to make between the positive and negative emotions because emotions, feelings, thoughts are part of being human. But the question is, well, yeah, what's, exactly. what's going to be productive here? What are these emotions we should want to have if we're driven to madness by anger? Well, that's not a good thing to say, oh, well, anger is part of being human. And it's just sort of a get out of jail free card that people might use. Well, that's not the following nature, right? Yeah, you're, and you're right. People do use that phrase. Uh, well, it's just human nature you know, yes. to, to justify all sorts of terrible things. You published a video in which Nietzsche lamented the Stoics and following <laughs> Nietzsche. 
<laughs> yeah, that, that comes up a lot in the discussions online, right? It's almost like a perennial thing. I, I, I don't think there's been a month where somebody hasn't posted about it in the main Facebook forum. And so that's one of the reasons I created the video so that I could I could just you know link to it and say, here's where the discussion is. Uh, yeah, Nietzsche has this line in, or actually not, not a line, a whole passage in one of his texts where he's just going after the Stoics. And, he, and he's doing so in a way that it, he knows is unfair because Nietzsche knows the Stoics quite well. He taught classical philology and wrote quite a bit on ancient philosophy and ancient rhetoric. So he, he actually does know that he's, he's being unfair to them. And he says, oh, you Stoics, you know, and he's got, yeah. he's got these, these three complaints. Probably the, the most, the toughest one in, in that bunch is you guys are just projecting your idea onto the, and then finding what you're looking for in it. So you're, yeah. you're, he talks about them as stoicizing nature, right? And, and what does he mean by that? Well, you know, the Stoics do think that despite, you know, uh, the, the world that we experience being kind of a mess, there is some sort of underlying logos or rationality governing it. Another thing too, by the way, that some modern Stoics dispense with, you know, this notion that there is, is a logos with a capital L that's providentially ordering everything. Mm -hmm. And, and Nietzsche says, listen, you Stoics, you know, you're finding that in there precisely because you put it there. So you're only finding what you're looking for. So your your position is is no good. And, you know, he doesn't provide any evidence whatsoever. He just, in Nietzsche's way, baldly asserts it. But a lot of people read that and they're like, oh, yeah, OK. So you can criticize the Stoics. Uh, so therefore, it must, you know, the idea must be bad. He also criticizes them for not having the same idea of nature as he does. He says, well, you're you're wrong about nature you know nature he doesn't say nature is, is you know red and bloody and tooth and but Nietzsche could have said uh, nature the way he thinks of it is this dynamic process in which everything is out to get everything else and to subordinate it or assimilate it and, and that's you know I mean the Stoics do think that a lot of things do work that way right animals behave like that but we have the capacity to be something more than just mere animals in that way and I, I guess Nietzsche is just saying that they're being very unrealistic so here's a one where we have like sort of a funda fundamental choice to make do you want to go with Nietzsche or do you want to go with the Stoics or do you want to say maybe both of them are wrong <laughs> but you can't harmonize all of these perspectives together and if we're going to say Nietzsche oh he's, he's caught the Stoics you know his critique is is really on point well he should have provided us with some evidence or some some reasons to think that what he's portraying is actually the case it's just not there in the passage. All right. I see from the Stoics, they're talking about a lamentation of complaining and saying, well, your nose is running, right? So mm -hmm. you have hands to wipe it. Here, here are these materials that you have, right? Or if you ha you have this problem, seek, seek others, talk with your friends, right? Be part of the community, right? This is just how the universe is. These are the resources you have. So consider that you're a human being. Do the work of being a human, right? This seems to be the Yeah, exactly. Nature. Yeah. And then, you know, there's, there's, um, there's quite a few things where the Stoics will acknowledge that, you know, there's nothing really we can do about it. Epictetus, he considers an imaginary complaint that somebody might make against Zeus, which is, why did you give me this body that's got all these urges and desires right, and stuff right. like that, you know, so that it would affect my mind? And, and, and Epictetus is like, listen, this is the way things work. You think that Zeus wouldn't have, you could have been made in such a way that you wouldn't have these problems. You think he wouldn't have done it? Yeah. <laughs> you know? So, yeah. And, and you, I mean, even if you take, um, the stoic conception of, of the divine out of the picture, I think the same thing stands, you know, we're, we're not being given challenges that we, we, we're not, we don't have any resources that we can bring to bear. We may not be successful. There's nothing that says that universe has to uh, treat us nice, give us second, third, fourth chances if we're doing dumb stuff. We do have a lot of, we generally have a lot more capacities than we credit ourselves as right. having. And the stoics will acknowledge that life is full of suffering it's not a dance right it's this warfare it's this <laughs> difficult journey yeah right that there's this wrestling that goes on the the olympic games right there's this comparison between life and difficult contests within That's the true, text. yeah yeah so yes part of that is acknowledging it it's not merely complaining but it's doing something about it right overcoming that adversity that's a that's a really good point so i mean if we 
I don't know that anybody's actually done this, but if we counted up all the different analogies and metaphors that are used, I think you'd be right that the majority of them are athletic comp- competitions mm-hmm. or preparation for that or military maneuvers, right. wars, things like that. I mean, there are also discussions of like the festival and, you know, enjoy the festival while, while it lasts. Yeah. There's, there's, a, there's other the, things like... The traveler in the inn, right? Yeah, exactly. Or going going ashore uh, when the captain calls, you know, get, get going. And there's a lot of examples that get used. Many of the examples are also from athletics or military training, so they're agonistic. I, I think you're right about that. Yeah. I think that's, pro- that's probably one of the things that a lot of people mix up what we can call lowercase stoicism, you know, lowercase s stoicism with, with actual stoicism. I think they, they associate stoicism with just toughness. Right, like a and, grin and bear it, yeah. Yeah, and that probably does come from a superficial exposure to a lot of these metaphors. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's not just that. There's even a passage in Seneca, a lesson to be learned from the burning of lions. That's one oh, of my yeah. favorite, right? Whereas this town was devastated in this great fire, nobody expected, and this man is mourning. And he said, well, maybe some of these things happen. It could be an opportunity for us to rebuild and come back stronger than ever. This analogy with the phoenix that I'm sure many would be familiar with. Yeah, that's a good point. Right. So we're we're going to accept that these things have happened and use the resources that we have as humans. That that could be the following nature as I see it. Yeah. Here's another point to it. So if we think about following nature as as following what a, a fully developed human nature could or, or ought to look like, it's it's going to be something that we do in incremental steps. So it's not going to be something where we get the blueprint and we just say, oh, okay, I got it. Now I'm going to go do this. You know, like like somebody giving us, I don't know, a diet or an exercise program. And, and we just, you know, all right, I got to get on these machines and do these things. Instead, it's, it's the sort of thing where... You know, uh, on the one hand, we, we can't be given uh, a perfect set of rules to, to do it. We, we have to actually cultivate these these virtues that then help us when we get into new situations to figure out what we need to do. There, you could you could say they transfer from domain to domain. Yes. We also, it's sort of like, I'm going to use a metaphor here. It's sort of like climbing hills and you get to the top of a hill and now you can see further. But part of what you see is that there's an even bigger hill that you, you couldn't see before ahead of you. But you can, in fact, look back and see how far you've come and you can see more of things. And now, you know, you think, well, OK, uh, let's say your goal is to have the best view possible. You're like, well, this isn't the best view because I'm still being blocked by this other big hill in front of me. Let me go climb that one. At least you know that when you do, you're going to get it. You're going to you're going to see more than you did before. Right. I think a lot of beginners one of the reasons why they expect there to be some sort of formula is because they haven't done that climbing yet. Mm-hmm. You know, they haven't, uh, that would be a thesis, right? That would be, that would be disciplining. Good. And perhaps that's one of the better parts of human nature that we want to accomplish, mm-hmm. that we want to have some sort of goal to take on some responsibility. Yeah. And you know, it's, that's interesting too. I haven't, I hadn't thought about this before. This is part of why I like doing these kind of dialogues it's precisely by engaging with these things that we we get to see what human nature really is capable of you know maybe we say oh i'm going to be a just person okay i I read some cicero you know on duties now i've got some vague conception of justice and it's not bad then i read some you know read around some more and give myself some some rules and then i start actually practicing it it you know it's going to take a while before precisely what justice should look like in myself even you know even the deficits are going to show up and that's something that a, a cow doesn't do a pig doesn't do you know that is distinctively human our, our awareness of our our lacks and where we have to go and our capacity for comparison to others an attitude of mindfulness throughout the stoic text to be aware of our strengths and our limitations so that we can be better people that we can grow that we can progress if we're so sure of ourselves that everything is in right order well that's not going to be good right that's not going to be honest yeah that's that's quite true good what do you think are some of the other parts of human nature that we should look to focus on the better parts of human nature from what we can tell from cicero the stoics were totally committed to the idea that human nature as rational nature was social nature 
that that we are connected with with other people by by virtue of being human. And sometimes this doesn't develop right. It, it can go into aberrations where we uh, only identify with, say, our own family, and we say screw everybody else. Mm-hmm. You know, <laughs> we become kind of parasitical on the larger society that we belong to. I mean, there, there, there's a, an actual term that you know you're you're familiar with, and I think many of your listeners are too, which is oikiosis, this literally uh, becoming affiliated with or becoming part of one household. And it starts out with, you know, a, a self-centeredness that, that we see infants and children have, but it's supposed to become something more. It's supposed to extend to others so that if I see you, you know, suffering, that's actually something that, that is bad for me because I, I, I care about you. Or there's that empathy. And yeah, yeah. And and uh, it doesn't mean that I have to like, you know, like Epictetus says, you know, sometimes you, you get down and groan with the person, just don't groan inwardly because, you know, you don't need to. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, you, you should get down there and sympathize with the person who's, who's had a loss. You know, th- this is a, a very important part of human nature. And I think a lot of people leave that out, especially when they have other conceptions of nature. So if you're like, you know, drawing on Nietzsche, that's not going to be something you care about. Or if you're thinking in terms of 19th century naturalism, you know, you're going to think every being is out for its own self. And if it's if it cares about its young, that's just a stupid blind instinct that it has. <laughs> you know, the Stoics think, no, no, this is this is actually something that can be perfected, that can be brought to a higher level. So I have a daughter who's going to be looking at, at colleges fairly soon. Sister would say, well, that's, you know, that's part of uh, inclination that you have as a parent to help, you know, look out for, for your young. To, to contribute to their flourishing. That's why you'll go and look at colleges with her and, um, you know, try to help her out when she gets anxious or worried or, you know, isn't asking the right questions that, that she'll want to ask later on. That's the development of, of rational human nature. The thing with humans is, as opposed to most of the other animals, which, you know, can go wrong in a number of ways, we can go wrong in almost an infinite variety of ways. So there's all sorts of ways in which our our human nature might not fully develop unless we have some sort of criteria or guidance. And that's what stoicism is supposed to provide us with. Good. And especially in Seneca, there's talk about friends and friendship Mm. and being of one mind, right? There's this benefit we see. It's a reciprocality where we'll have these conversations with our friends to help us improve, to question ourselves. They should alert us to deficiencies that we might have that we can work together for a mutual benefit. And Epictetus talks about that. I'll come back to Seneca in a minute because there's something else I want to point out. But Epictetus talks about that too, like in his role as a teacher. He's talking to somebody. He's like, what, you're going to come in my classroom and I'm not going to give you a hard time? Because, <laughs> yeah. you know, if somebody comes along and says, oh, this guy's still, you know, a screw up, then you can point back at me and say, well, Epictetus didn't do his job. You know, he mm-hmm. just told me that I was already great. And uh, he didn't, he didn't, you know, force me to confront the, the problems that I, I needed to deal with. Seneca, you're, you're right. He talks about, Friendship involves a kind of unanimity, which which means having one mind, right? But he also talks in terms of, and, and Cicero actually uses this term too, concordia, which means to have one's heart, one's core with, with others. Later on in the Middle Ages, this will get understood in terms of like compatibility of wills. But these guys aren't really talking that much in terms of, of, of will. Um, they're thinking in terms of like thinking the same thoughts. It's also having the same the same values, the same sets of desires and aversions, uh, right. the same things that you respect. And that's part of what makes friendship so so wonderful when we really do experience it. You know, think about the the enjoyment that comes with finding that somebody actually agrees with you and thinking that something that um, you thought you were the only person who sees things that way. They they agree with you and thinking that's important. That's that's a good emotion to have. Yeah, good. You feel fit in, you have a community, there's that like-mindedness. And I hear this in the philosophical group that I host locally. A lot of people come here and say, well, I can't really have these conversations with family members or other people I know. They're just really closed off to it. So yes, people look for that community, right? That's a a really interesting thing. I, I, you know, we have the same thing happening here in our Milwaukee Stoic Fellowship. Hear that a lot in the online events that I do. That, that same sentiment of, listen, I, I just can't find anybody else who shares these 
these values. You know, they don't want to read books. They don't want, they don't want to read philosophy and talk about it. And so if you think about the opportunities of our time, I mean, think about what we're doing right here, right? You're in Pennsylvania. I'm, in, I'm here in Wisconsin. Mm-hmm. Sunday evening, we're able to get on Skype and and talk back and forth with each other. Whereas 20 years ago, this that, this would have been an impossibility. Right. And, and what would you have done with this conversation? There wasn't any podcasting back then. Sure. And, and now you can reach, you know, thousands or potentially tens or hundreds of thousands of people who can hear this and be like, oh, yeah, I, I get it too. So we, we can create a virtual community. Yeah, and sharing that information with others is definitely a benefit. So yes, we're doing this of our own interest to help others, to help ourselves and grow in the process. So there are a lot of benefits. Now, how about interactions between one's environment and genetics? How can we think of human nature as a mix between the two? Yeah, so this is something that comes up in my classes a lot, especially when students come in and they've been introduced to the nature versus nurture question. And I always point out to them that it's not so simple as nature versus nature or nature and nurture because there's also choice involved too. The reason why scientists don't really like to talk about that is because that's much more unpredictable. <laughs> but you know, you can you can certainly observe a, an environment and observe some some form of environmental determinism. It's usually uh, not anything involving necessity. It's something involving probabilities, right? And the same thing with with genes, right? We can look at our genetic code, which is amazing what we can find out these days, right? I found out, for example, I'll come back to the point in just a minute, but I found <laughs> out, for example, that one reason why I drink so much coffee is I actually carry a gene that reduces the effect of caffeine. On me. Uh-huh. And so I got to drink more to get, you know, I, I, I drink like one to two pots of coffee a day, uh, which is not really good for you, but it's not <laughs> terrible for you either. But it would be bad for somebody that caffeine affects a lot. And so finding this out, you know, helps to sort of put things in, in perspective. And, and there's so many other things too, right? And so we can think in terms of the environment, in terms of the physical environment, in terms of the culture that you live in, your, your family. We can think in terms of uh, your actual genetics. All of those are, in fact, part of nature. And the Stoics would say, you, you can't ignore those things. But um, we're not reducible to them either. So you can come from a terrible family and you're probably going to have a lot more to struggle with than somebody who's raised in a nurturing, supportive home. But it's not impossible for you to, you know, slowly get your, your desires and aversions and choices and thoughts and feelings and all these sorts of things that the Stoics focused on into a, a better alignment with, with what you want to be. Same thing with, you know, where you, where you grow up or, you know, some of us are, some of us have more mental capacity. Uh, better memory, you know, quicker reasoning faculties, but but that doesn't mean that as human beings we can't we can't do that. You know, we, we don't expect exactly the same thing out of everybody. Uh, like Epictetus says, some of us are uh, uh, the majority of us are the the white threads in the the toga, and <laughs> every once in a while there's a purple thread, right? right? And there's nothing wrong with white threads, right? As a matter of fact, if you want to, have a, you don't want the whole toga purple, so <laughs> you better have a lot of white threads. But so so. Any Anyway, to to come back to that, you can think of those as the sort of raw material of human nature that then we can work upon rather than uh, completely determining causes that we can use as excuses. Right. Yes, to be aware of certain urges, desires, possible negative influences, and work to maybe guard against those things like uh, urge for... reproduction some biological exactly. urges right shall that be the guiding force in our life or maybe we could say well you know what i'll just go ahead and do my own thing and be more careful here and not try to get 20 people pregnant to you know <laughs> yeah the extremes there right these days that would really place you in terrible circumstances you know imagine the child support for 20 kids yeah <laughs> uh, I, I don't know how much income you'd have to make yeah, and now it manifests itself today, perhaps in the hookup culture. Maybe people will um, have that urge addressed there. I don't know, but that can get people into a lot of trouble too. So we're going to think about, yes, what are these parts of being human? Should we follow this? People might say, well, we have this urge to have sex. So should we just go ahead and follow that and go gusto? It's go full force on it. Yeah, in, in, a, in a sort of non thoughtful way you can say meaning not not thinking about consequences not thinking about what you actually 
are looking for. You know, because I think a lot of the people that are that are out there and, and the, the hookup culture and, and, you know, the whole set of apps associated with it is kind of a lonely place. That's, that's what people report. I don't know, you know, firsthand because I, I'm not a participant in that. Mm-hmm. I'm happily married. Although, you know, we did have our own version of that back back in the day before the internet as well. You know, it, it's interesting because we, we tend to try to solve about most of our problems through technological means. You know, can't can't find somebody to hook up with. Uh, get an app like Tinder, you know, um, and then just scroll through people. And a- as you're doing that, you're developing habits, and you're you're changing your your mind slowly, and you're not doing so in a, a way that's going to be realizing human nature, especially if what you really deeply desire is not just to satisfy a physical urge of, of sexual enjoyment, which which is fun, right? I mean, it, the human body does respond <laughs> properly sure. to that sort of thing. But, you know, if you're really looking for something like intimacy, you know, a lasting connection where, where sexuality is, is just a, a vehicle or a part of that, like Masonius Rufus talks about, right? You know, in, in uh, his discussion of marriage, he says, well, you know, the purpose of marriage is children. And then he goes on. And, and I think a lot of the people who, who you know, want to harness Masonius Rufus for, for religious reasons often mm-hmm. don't read any further because what he says is having sex is supposed to provide this context of mutual affection that is supposed to be, that's what a marriage is about. And so, you know, if, if we get away from the language of marriage and we just talk in terms of a committed relationship and the, the goods that come with that, you know, Musonius, if you were around today, would say, well, sex is, you know, fun, but it's really for intimacy. It's really for developing something that you you share with with somebody else. And, you know, if kids come out of that, that's great, too, because, you know, the human race continues. And we we do need, you know, just if we think in terms of demographics, we do need a whole bunch of new young workers coming up or we're all going to go broke. Uh, But it's, it's really about something more valuable. And it goes back to, you know, we were talking about friendship just a little bit before. A genuine marriage for somebody like Musonius or for Cicero, who also talks about this, is a friendship. Mm. Yep. And it's more of a recent thing of just getting the government involved in it and a lot of the stuff that people attach to it. Perhaps you can have those goods if that's what you want to do without the contract and without a lot of the things in today's society that people say, well, marriage has been distorted. Look at the divorce rate. Look at all the risks that are associated with it. And they look yeah. to opt out. Yeah. I mean, if you think about it, just let's let's say we just sort of put it in the framework of prudence, right? Does it make sense to spend, I mean, the average I think that people spend on weddings now is about 50 grand. You know, most of that is is money that you're never going to see any sort of return on, you know? I mean, you do hire a photographer and so they take some nice pictures and you can look at the pictures and say, oh, that was such a great day. But for most people, the way they talk about their weddings from the the accounts that I've seen, it goes like, it's it's a blur, right? Shell out thousands of dollars for caterers who may do a good job or may do a crap job. Um, If they do a bad job, it's not like you're going to get your money back and, and it's not like they get a second chance because there's only one time. And, you know, people eat the stuff and they're like, oh, so they, they just had these options for the wedding. <laughs> they're not very <laughs> grateful about it. And, you know, there's a gift giving thing, right? I mean, if you spend a lot on the wedding, I guess people feel the, the need to buy you a blender or, you know, a rug <laughs> or candles or whatever, whatever thing you put in your, what do they call that? A registry, right? Yeah, yeah. And we can go on and on through this, you know, the, the dresses, all that stuff. It's from a, from a, just thinking about it in terms of the virtue of prudence is this a good way to use money or could you better spend that i mean not even necessarily on yourself you could just walk down the street take you know just one tenth of that take five grand and hand out ten dollar bills to people on the street and and (laughs) tell them uh, i want you to have a good meal and uh you know this is this is on us to celebrate our our nuptials um you know, and if you can, you know, kind of get your life back on track. I don't know, maybe give each person a hundred bucks. So, so you're helping, what, 50 people? Uh, uh, have some apartment payments or house payments or something. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's so many things you, you could do with it. So spending it on a wedding is ridiculous. I mean, the only reason why you do it, I guess, is is well there's two reasons. What <laughs> so there is there's a wedding industry and you are helping some people by by hiring them so you're a job creator (laughs) um but that's not a very good reason and then i suppose you know your family wants to see this and it's it's an occasion for people to get together but that's not a very good argument really when you think about it 
and and the Stokes are saying not not to do things for display or fame or reputation, right? They're they're yeah, trying exactly. to uh, go away from that, right? So they're yeah. I, this would probably be something where ancient Stokes would say, "Listen, it's it's part of the culture. We got to do this. It's expected." But I think modern Stokes might say, "I don't know." Prudence would probably suggest we do something else instead. You know, if we are going to have a celebration, let's have it be a potluck, and nobody has to dress up. We'll just do a nice ceremony, and every you know, we won't invite anybody who we don't want to invite. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right, a lot, a lot of drama can get involved with it as well. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Yeah, and that's what Stoicism is urging us to do, right? Question the things that society values that we desire. And okay, well, these might be these urges, these desires that we have, or society says are good, but question those things, look at them for what they are and say, is this really the kind of life we want to live? Is this a prudent behavior? Is this going to lead to better life? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yes. So might it be difficult as a Stoic to fit in with society, given that others may stray far from the paths that we aspire to follow? Yeah, it depends on the society that you're in. I mean, sometimes people bring up these situations that are rather extreme, like, well, what if you're living in a totalitarian society? Well, you're probably not going to survive that long as a Stoic, then, because you're going to like take stands on principle, and then they'll they'll kill you. Uh, you know, it, it gets tougher when when it's situations like um, them threatening your family. You know, and in some of the the suicides in in Roman times people would commit suicide precisely so that their family would be killed they would they would have to make choices like that in 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 our modern western society where you know we do sometimes face random violence or you know if we're uh, disadvantaged classes we might have to face police brutality or things like that but for the most part we we don't face that and instead what we have to think about is like uh, social disapproval. You're not participating in, in this. You know, you're not doing things the way that we do. And, and that can be tough. You know, I, I think one of the things that we forget sometimes when giving advice about stoicism is that everybody begins at their beginning. And, you know, if we tell them, oh, well, here's how, here's the way you have to act as a stoic, and they don't measure up to it, then they feel like, well, screw it. I can't I can't do this. Instead, we, we you know, we should say, well, you're going to fall down all the time. And here's where you want to get to, but here's what it's like when you fail. Uh, Other people have done it. Here's how you get back on track so that you're now moving towards that that goal. And it's I think it works that way with social disapproval. Some of us will do things where we would say abandon Epictetus's advice where he says, hey, listen, if you're supposed to be doing something, don't worry about what anybody thinks when you're doing it. And if you're not supposed to be doing it, don't do it, you know? Mm-hmm. So we're, you know, we'll fail at that. But then we, we get ourselves back on track and, and we, we deal with it. And over time, it gets better. And if we do that, you know, to, to do that, we talked about the virtue of, of um, prudence. That's involving developing the virtue of courage, taking difficult stands, Sometimes when it's when it's uh, feels bad for us to do so, it's not really bad for us, but but we feel bad because we we want we just still desire that approval of other people, or you could say we're averse to hearing bad stuff about ourselves. Right. Um, and the Stoics, I think, are looking at us not to value or look for that external approval so much to be just content with our own way and our own lifestyle to, as Seneca says, be our own spectators and seek our own applause, right? That yeah, exactly. We, we can be content even in our own time. I think that's a major thing I take from Stoicism and not depending on others being around all the time to just say, well, I have my own time. I can be content with that. I can keep myself occupied. I have a yeah. lot to do, right? This this idea of being bored is so foreign to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me too. Uh, but that, in part, that's not because I've made so much progress in terms of Stoic philosophy, but I overcommit myself so oh. that I, I always have too much to do, you know. And I forget the fact that I'm, you know, I'm in middle age and I'm going to get sick. Uh, and then, you know, I'll, I'll tell you something that's been going on for like the last, oh, almost like two months now. So there's a flu and uh it lasts you know weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and people are getting it here they're getting it in europe there are a few days where you're like totally down and out you know you're you're like in a haze you you just should lay in bed all day 
But most of the time, what happens instead is, uh, you know, you, you feel okay, but not great. And then you do a bit of work and then you're totally exhausted. So there, there have been days where like, I'll go and walk the dogs and I'll come back in with them. And that's like 15 minutes of, of physical exercise. And I'll be like, wow, uh, I should take a nap. And I, of course, I don't take a nap because I've got so much work to do. And so then I'll do a couple things. And I notice too, if there's anything that really demands a lot of engagement, like uh, doing an online event or an in-person event, or even filming, because uh, I, I put a lot of, you could say, energy into, into filming because I'm pretending there's an audience. I'm just wiped out after that. Oh, there is an audience. And, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so... I saw that as just an exception and I was like, I'm going to get better next week, you know? And maybe if I was in my twenties, I would have, I, I don't know, but I'm, I'm in my late forties. And so I got to get used to this sort of thing, which is, Hey, your body's not going to cooperate with what your mind wants to do, you know? And you can, you can set out your color coded calendar with, you know, doing this thing at this time and this project at that time. But if your body isn't up to it, um, that work's not going to get done. You know? So, so I, I'm, I'm slowly realizing this lesson that um, until like, until I'm fully better, I just can't schedule as much work. And even after that, I might have to like be a bit more realistic with myself about what I can, I can, I can say, Oh, well, you know, um, 50 is the new 30 or some, some <laughs> BS line like that. And that's not going to get me through it. I have to be realistic about what's what's actually the case uh, for human beings and, you know, realize that 20 years from now, I'm going to be 67. And if I think I'm slowing down now, man, I'll really be slowing down then. So I'd better get myself in a groove that I can I can actually meet all of my commitments and obligations. Now, you know, you're a younger guy, so you don't have to face up to this. <laughs> Almost sooner 30. or later, you're going to have to. <laughs> Yeah, sure. Yeah. So be, being aware of our bodies, what we can handle and not overworking ourselves, right? That that would be going against nature, wouldn't it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and you know, not getting ticked off about it or uh, feeling a sense of embarrassment or regret. None of those things are going to be productive. They're not going to fix my schedule. And if I, you know, if I just try to do do it through sheer willpower, oh, that's a recipe for disaster <laughs> right there. <laughs> so, it could be dangerous. Burnout. I mean, you're to be congratulated for having stuff with this week in week out 50 episodes oh thanks um, yes I, I think most podcasts just just don't manage to do that so that that's a i mean that's a good example of of uh of fortitude right it's it's not always overcoming fears it's it's sometimes like making sure that you actually show up and do the work mm -hmm. when you're you're supposed to do it yeah it's a process of getting the content writing the scripts getting the guests and everything but i think it's been going really well helping for my benefit and the benefit of the audience here. Yeah, that's that's where it was with me finding a lot of benefits from stoicism and wanting to share those with other people to help others. It's good. You know, that so that's kind of a good segue back to talking about our, our shared social nature, right? So you, you know, you study stoicism, like you said, you, you find things in it that work for you. And I mean, you could just say, Oh, that's, this is great. Screw everybody else. You know, <laughs> I'm going to live my life. Just keep this um, to myself. But, yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, why should I help my competitors? Uh, <laughs> you know, be better for them to have some totally screwed up perspective because then they won't, they won't, you know, uh, do as well as I do. No, you do exactly the opposite. And that that's, you know, the Stoics see that as sort of a natural development of, of healthy human nature. Right. Being part of the community, contributing something worthwhile. I think there's a lot of meaning in that, a lot of um, things. And you're doing the same as well, overbooking yourself and having a lot going on. <laughs> yeah. Good. Well, the, the overbooking might actually be foolishness rather than prudence. <laughs> so you'll work to follow nature and... Have a better yeah. schedule, but yeah. perhaps is that, well, I see that's a that's a really you know sort of humble, uh, <laughs> but but I, I think a, a, a kind of uh, example that many people can relate to, right? Uh, don't don't so many people overbook themselves, or even worse, like think about parents who overbook their kids. Oh, big problem these days because they want their kids to have this great life and you know be able to do their college applications and win in the big game, and the poor kids are miserable. You know, they just want to play, and I, I'm I'm really happy. I didn't have parents like that myself. They were they were more on the other side, where they they turn you outside on a summer day and say, "All right, we don't want to see you till lunchtime." <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, good. All right. Any other items for closing here? 
Well, I mentioned that there is some controversy among modern Stoics about whether we should get rid of this idea about living in accordance with nature. Maybe maybe it presupposes an ancient conception of nature that is is no longer helpful. And and there's some you know pretty good uh, thinkers behind this. Lawrence Becker is one of them in, in his new Stoicism. He, he proposes that. Peter Stankiewicz, one of the modern Stoicism team, he, he's, he's pretty set in that. I think that there really is a good reason to keep on talking about living in accordance with nature, but we have to do a lot better job in explaining precisely what that is. So I do have a book project that I'm working on. It's nowhere near completion at this time, unfortunately. I'd love to be able to say, oh yeah, it's coming out at such and such a date, but I, I don't know when it'll be coming out. But I thought it's it's an important enough topic to actually do that level of writing on, because there's so many discussions of it within classic Stoic literature. Good. All right. And can you give us some more information about yourself, where people can find you online, your websites, your work? Reasonio.com, which is my, my business. There's my, my YouTube channel, which is, uh, you just type in Gregory B. Sadler, it'll come up. Or actually, if you type in Stoicism videos, you'll probably see there aren't that many of them out there. So <laughs> the ones that I've done are, are a pretty sizable portion of them. If people want to support me, they can do that on uh, patreon.com slash Sadler, uh, because a lot of the work that I do is pro bono all the video production uh, the editing for stoicism today um all those sorts of things and of course you should read stoicism today that's the uh, blog of the modern stoicism organization we get a lot of really cool papers guest posts uh interesting announcements in there and i, I think that pretty much sums it up right yeah. and that's that's modern stoicism.com right exactly yeah good very good. Thanks for coming on and chatting once again. Hopefully we'll arrange for this in future months. Oh, sure. Yeah, I'm always happy to come on. Thanks for listening and stay tuned for more content. Visit my website at stoicsolutionspodcast.com where you can connect with me on social media and listen to past episodes. Support my work by becoming a donor through Patreon or PayPal to access special rewards, including the ability to have upcoming guests answer your questions, custom podcast episodes, group conversations with me and podcast listeners, and one-on-one -on -one discussions. Join my new Discord chat server, linked in the show notes, for interactive discussion with me and people interested in Stoicism. Share, comment, like, subscribe, and leave reviews to help support my efforts and keep this project going. Email me with your thoughts, justinvacula at gmail.com. Podcast music, used with permission, is brought to you by Phil Giordana's symphonic metal group Fairyland. The song titled Master of the Waves is from their album Score to a New Beginning. Find more information in the show notes. Have a great day.